Falling stars. Not so long ago, they were considered omens, warnings. Now we know that falling stars are meteors burning in the heat of atmospheric friction as they approach the Earth. But to scientists who are concerned with bringing spacecraft back from beyond the atmosphere, a falling star is still a warning. A briefly incandescent reminder that re-entry from great distance presents serious problems. And in the laboratory, scientists have produced a close approximation of re-entry heating to study its effect on materials being considered for use in re-entry vehicles. Kennedy, Florida. Area 12, assigned to Project Fire, the program that provided important information about re-entry phenomena. Prior to Project Fire, all that was known on the subject was based on re-entry at lesser speeds than those now contemplated. NASA initiated Project Fire to replace prediction and extrapolation with information. The plan was to send up and drive back to Earth an instrumented probe, a re-entry package. A package that would broadcast from the re-entry environment and report the conditions its own atmospheric friction and shock wave would create. This information would provide a foundation on which to build an acceptable theory of re-entry heating. Cape Kennedy, Pad 12. It's April 14, 1964. At 4.42 p.m., this Atlas D will carry aloft the re-entry package built for Project Fire by Republic Aviation Corporation. The package is up there, inside the shroud. It's a 200-pound, 26-inch, blunt-nosed cone loaded with instruments and electronic gear. The Atlas will start it on a ballistic trajectory down the Atlantic Missile Range. Between the re-entry package and the Atlas is the Velocity package, an Antares rocket. It will drive the re-entry package back into the Earth's atmosphere at more than 25,000 miles per hour, the speed it would reach if it were returning from the moon. T minus 12 minutes. Preparation for this event started years ago with basic research into re-entry problems. At Republic's Paul Moore Research Center, a special laboratory is devoted to this subject. Here, the hypersonic shock tunnel, called Long Shot, provides realistic simulation of many aspects of the overall re-entry problem. And the laboratory's ARC jet facility has for several years been investigating ablation materials and refractory metals. Systematic studies of ceramics, phenolics, and numerous exotic compounds have been conducted. These experiments have added to the body of scientific knowledge in the general field of high temperature research, and have had specific application in determining how various materials would be affected by exposure to the amount of heat predicted for vehicles returning from lunar or interplanetary missions. Company-sponsored basic research provided a significant background in heat protection methods. Republic's assignment as contractor for the re-entry package subsystem on Project Fire was to translate the NASA concept into practical hardware. In other words, to design, fabricate, and support a re-entry package that, within a 45-second traverse of the re-entry environment, would acquire and transmit the specified information. To accomplish its mission, the package would have to withstand many destructive forces and conditions. These included the launch, acceleration to 37,000 feet per second, deceleration upon encountering the Earth's atmosphere, aerodynamic heating, and radiation heating. Several basic design concepts were considered, and a sectional configuration was chosen. The afterbody contained the C-band tracking beacon antenna, 
the internal cooling equipment, and the telemetry antennas. The forebody included the major instruments, the electronic gear, and the heat shield. In specifications for the heat shield, NASA recognized that the heat level predicted for the cone face would incinerate any known calorimeter material. With this in mind, a dual-purpose composite structure was devised. Three layers of solid beryllium in which heat sensors would be implanted, and alternate layers of a phenolic asbestos compound, ablation of which would delay heating of the beryllium. Each of the asbestos layers was to be in four sections with provision for separation on command. It was known that heat flux information of greatest value would come from the calorimeters and the beryllium layers just before melting. Therefore, rapid ejection of asbestos layers would be necessary. Exposure of each beryllium layer at a precise instant during the heat experience would produce significant readings at the three important points on the heat curve. From hundreds of conferences such as this and from many thousands of engineering man hours, a final design emerged ready for fabrication. Fabrication of components for the re-entry package was entrusted in part to subcontractors, each chosen with regard to special capabilities. At Johns Manville, sheet material was subjected to pressure and heat to form the afterbody cone. Other important suppliers were the Radio Corporation of America and the Brush Beryllium Company. RCA contributed significantly to the solution of electronic problems and manufactured much of the electronic equipment. Brush furnished the metallic layers of the heat shield. Republic's own experimental shops produced the major structural elements, among them the compartmented support for the sensitive instruments and the electronic gear. The phenolic asbestos layers of the composite heat shield were also manufactured at Republic. It was necessary to make enough sets of four to assemble a prototype vehicle, a special model for the Atlantic missile range, two launch packages, spares, and extras for testing. With the shop work finished, the balance of the fabrication, assembly, and inspection was performed in protected areas to prevent contamination that might affect performance of the re-entry package. Fabrication was not without complications. In several instances, techniques beyond the current state of the art were required. One example was the meticulous task of attaching wires to the calorimeters in the heat shields. Each of the three beryllium layers contained three rows of calorimeters consisting of thermocouples embedded in holes in the metal. Success of the project was dependent on proper functioning of these tiny heat-sensitive elements. The leaves from the thermocouples were only three thousandths of an inch in diameter. Welding these delicate strands to the connecting wires involved development of new skills and methods. Advanced fabrication techniques generate equally sophisticated inspection procedures. Here, as throughout the fabrication period, the inherent reliability of the re-entry package design was preserved by rigorous application of quality control procedures. A definite advance in technology was the development by Republic engineers of total and spectral radiometers that could fulfill mission requirements while conforming to stringent specifications. One of the primary objectives of the re-entry experiment was measurement of the intensity of the radiance from incandescent gases that would build up on the face of the cone. Spectral characteristics of the radiance would be needed to help determine the chemical composition of gases present. These electronic optical instruments were small and lightweight, yet could perform in an environment where the expected maximum radiation was 10,000 times the minimum. The flaming atmosphere outside the re-entry package was monitored by the radiometers through a system of windows. Quartz was selected for the window material because of its spectral pass band and its resistance to heat. There was another factor to be considered. During ablation of the shield layers, the quartz itself would radiate and distort the readings. The extent of this effect was determined so that corrections could be applied in evaluation of radiometer data.
Design and construction of support equipment was an important phase of the project. The fixture in use here was just one of the many tools and devices that were created at Republic to facilitate the production and assembly of the various structural elements that made up the reentry package. The segments remained securely clamped in the fixture while the seam compound was heat cured. One of the most critical operations in the entire procedure was the assembly of the beryllium layers and the phenolic layers to form the finished heat shield. One crushed wire or broken connection could have set up a future malfunction. One wrong move could have caused loss of all the effort already expended on the parts. While fabrication and assembly had been proceeding, other aspects of the program had been moving forward. The instruments and electronic equipment had been designed and constructed or procured and had been separately tested and qualified. As a system check, units that were to be installed on the re-entry package were connected to a complex of test equipment and to each other. This was a setup similar to the breadboard stage of many electronic experiments. There were two VHF-FM telemetry transmitters, one for real-time transmission, the other to be fed from the magnetic tape recorder after a 45-second delay that would overlap the predicted 30-second transmission blackout. Operation of the breadboard was a complete functional rehearsal with equipment performing just as it would in flight. Transmitting from the clean room to telemetry receivers like those that would pick up the broadcast during re-entry. All the elements on the breadboard and more were fitted into their allocated spaces in the forebody. The total payload comprised over 450 pieces of equipment interconnected with a mile or more of wire. The afterbody was supported during assembly by a hinged handling fixture to assure accurate fitting to the forebody. And there it was, the 200-pound, 26-inch, blunt-nosed cone, the heavily instrumented re-entry package for Project Fire. The next step was balancing to assure stability after spin-up and separation from the velocity package. Balance was achieved by addition of small corrective masses at locations determined by the instrumentation. Then the unit was mounted on the adapter, a structural component built at Republic to serve as the interface between the re-entry package and the velocity package. The assembly was spun at the rate of rotation it would achieve in flight and dynamically balanced about its longitudinal axis. The package was live, its electronic equipment operating, and as in the breadboard stage, output was checked by remote telemetry receivers. From the beginning of Project Fire, a comprehensive test program had been in operation. Among the early tests was a verification of the system for a separation of the re-entry package from the velocity package. Slow motion film documented the test procedure. In a NASA wind tunnel, the method for ejection of the phenolic layers of the heat shield was evaluated. The slow motion camera made the action appear 1 20th as fast as normal. And here, for even closer scrutiny, 1 70th normal. Overall, more than 3,000 tests were performed at Republic on materials, components, and sub-assemblies. And the completed package, with its electronic equipment activated, was subjected to a series of stresses that proved its ability to withstand the rigors of the ground and flight environments. 
Exposure to elevated temperature, humidity, and vacuum conditions was followed by shock testing, as shown here. Throughout the test program, signals transmitted by the package were monitored to determine whether the applied stresses were affecting performance of the system. Several modes, levels, and rates of vibration were applied to the package. And finally, at the Picatinny Arsenal, the package was installed on the big centrifuge and brought up to the prescribed load of 120 Gs without harm. Prior to completion and testing of the reentry package at Republic's Farmingdale plant, the company's launch team had set up operations at Cape Kennedy. The AMR model of the reentry package was used for verification of all pre-launch procedures. Important among these was mating of the package and adapter with hardware from the other companies involved in the project. The velocity package was supplied and supported by the astronautics division of Ling Temco Vought. Integration of all project fire systems was the responsibility of General Dynamics Astronautics as was the Atlas D launch vehicle. The actual reentry package on arrival at the Cape was subjected to a number of reacceptance tests. Here, both the physical mating and the electronic compatibility with the velocity package are being checked. The diagnostic instruments in use were brought from Farmingdale. The entire assembly, re-entry package, adapter, and velocity package was set up in the NASA spin facility and balanced as a unit. Then the preparations for flight. First, the Atlas, the basic booster, 360,000 pounds of packaged thrust. 5,000 miles downrange, Ascension Island was ready. Aircraft with telemetry and tracking equipment awaited the signal to take off for assigned stations along the range. With the Atlas poised on the pad, the velocity package was moved in. Ships with receiving equipment had already taken their positions. The payload arrived, the tiny instrument-packed flight article on which everything depended. The re-entry package, that was the reason for all this activity. Republic launch team members were on hand to work with other contractors in setting up the package on top of the motive power. T minus 12 minutes. In Hangar D, Republic personnel and checkout equipment monitored test transmission of simulated data as the package waited for liftoff. And in the blockhouse, other Republic people and instrumentation were among those present. From the Mission Control Center in the Goddard Building, NASA checked everything. And committed the vehicle. entry package was driven back into the atmosphere at 37,000 feet per second. Re-entry started at 400,000 feet. At that point began the critical 45 seconds, perhaps the most drastic three quarters of a minute that instrumentation had ever been asked to withstand. A few seconds later, heating had progressed to the point where hot gas and plasma prevented radio transmission, but the tape recorder inside was not affected. The radio blackout lasted through the peak heating period. Telemetry could not be reestablished until after heating had abated. While all 
this was happening, during the same 45 seconds, the composite heat shield was performing according to plan. The outer layer provided readings of the initial heat buildup, then burned away, calorimeters and all, exposing the first asbestos layer. At a predetermined instant, the asbestos was ejected. The second beryllium layer, with a fresh set of calorimeters, experienced the peak heat load before melting. The next asbestos layer was ejected, and the remaining beryllium layer monitored the last of the three significant regions. Its mission finished, the re-entry package plunged into the Atlantic Ocean, not far from Ascension Island. Just 32 minutes had elapsed from liftoff to splash. Just 45 seconds of that time had been spent in the critical re-entry environment. And the results? More than three million separate bits of information had been acquired by the re-entry package and transmitted to the various receiving stations. Republic's computer facilities were involved in reduction of this material for final evaluation by the Langley Research Center of NASA. Project FIRE had provided a reliable group of guidelines, a definitive set of benchmarks which will materially aid in the design of future spacecraft, vehicles that will bring our astronauts safely back from far places. Republic Aviation Corporation is proud to have had a part in this important scientific achievement. <laughs>